Hey everybody, I want to read you something. When the lights went off, the accompanist kissed her. Maybe he had been turning towards her just before it was completely dark. Maybe he was lifting his hands. There must have been some movement, a gesture, because every person in the living room would later only remember a kiss. That is the very first line of Anne Platchett's Bel Canto, which is the book I will be reviewing for you guys today. This was my February TBR bar, TBR jar challenge book of the month, which was to read a book that music notes on the cover. Has music notes on the cover. That first line is probably one of the most beautiful first lines I have ever read in a book. Ever. I'm sitting here and I just keep rereading this line because it's so beautiful. Now, when I first started reading this book, I had no idea really why that line was so important until I finished the novel. And let me tell you, that line is perfect. It's perfect. Perfect. Okay? This novel hits on so many themes that I have not read anything on in a long time. And it was so refreshing. It was an amazing story. The only downside is it's definitely one of those books that if I tell you what it's about, it will ruin it. I know that sounds really bad and it sounds like a cop out, but it's the truth. And you might understand if I put in this term. Have you ever seen a movie that the twist ending is so good that you can really only watch the movie one freaking time because you know what happens and it, it kind of, once you know, it, you don't have the same feeling in the movie and it's really hard to watch it again with the same passion. The next times you watch it, you're just kind of watching it to see if you can figure out the ending before it actually happens. This book is kind of like that, but if I were to tell you what this book is about, the ending of the book, which is so abrupt, so short, the ending just kind of comes out of nowhere, really. Like you're reading and then it just ends. But the ending this book has, there wasn't any really other way that this story could have ended. Now, there are three themes that the story touches on that I do want to talk about. And hopefully that will whet your palate enough to want to pick up this book and read it without me having to tell you and ruin the story for itself, for you for itself. The first theme is music. One of the main characters in the book, Roxanne Cross, Koss, is an opera singer, a very famous, well-known opera singer whose voice just stuns people when it comes forth from her. People are enamored and in just in awe of her when she sings, okay? I know that feeling. I'm not saying people have done that when I sing, but I've, I've heard singers, I've heard opera singers literally just take you on a journey with their voice. I took 10 years of professional singing lessons in the operatic voice and I am not good at all. <laughs> I'm fully aware that I'm not. But if you have a love of opera, you will appreciate this next statement. Opera is one of those vocal stylings that literally transports you. No matter what language it's in, whether it's Italian, Russian, Spanish, English, you know exactly what's going on, even if you don't understand the words. That is why opera is so powerful. And I know a lot of people who say opera is so boring, I don't understand it. It's basically because you're not fucking paying attention. If you shut up for 10 goddamn minutes and actually listen to what the girl and the guy are saying, or if you sit down and watch an opera play out, the story will unfold itself and you don't even have to know what the words mean. I don't have to know what bel canto means. It actually means beautiful singing, just so you know in Spanish, but you don't have to know that when you hear it sang because of the inflection and the actions of the singers. Opera singing is an art form. Singing is a talent. To me, opera is an art form because it is something that envelops you. It's something that you are. You don't just sing opera. You are an opera singer. It is everything about you. And Roxanne Koss definitely represents that whole picture 
in this book amazing. I really wish like this book had a soundtrack to it because I would totally listen to the soundtrack while she was singing and it's just amazing. Um, so if you are not a lover of opera, you will lose a large portion of the beauty of this book. So if you do love opera, you will respect the music tones, the, the musical references in this book so much more. If you are not a lover of opera, will you still like the story? Yes, you still might like the story, but you will lose a chunk of it. You will lose so much of the story if you can't stand opera or will not even take the time to listen to it. So I highly recommend any opera. Madame Butterfly is amazing. Highly recommend that one. It's amazing. Anything by Puccini, check them out, especially if you plan on reading this book. Um, amazing. Amazing vocal talents, amazing art form, and Anne Patchett explains it exquisitely in here. The way she references when Roxanne starts to sing that the look she describes on the people's face is how it's like just heaven has opened up because it has. If you've seen live opera, if you've ever experienced it, you will know what that feeling is. It's, it might be better than sex. I'm not even gonna lie to you. It could totally be better than sex because I don't cry during sex, but I cry during opera because it's that fucking beautiful, okay? Not saying all sex, but you know, majority of it. Um, the second theme this book really touches on is Stockholm Syndrome. It's not the main theme, but it's definitely seen throughout the novel. Um, it's not broken down and said, it doesn't actually say Stockholm Syndrome, but if you know what Stockholm Syndrome is, it is forming relationships with captors. Uh, loosely based. You see a lot in films of young girls that have been abducted and kept for extended periods of time and they form relationships with their captors, usually fall in love with them and therefore have a weird relationship bond with their captor. It's a very odd syndrome to have because as a human you would think you would do everything in your power to protect yourself and your livelihood and your life, but you never think that maybe your form of protection is to not have any. And it sounds really backwards, but if you let your walls down, you let yourself be, be vulnerable just once and they see it and they don't do anything and you keep doing it and you still show that you're scared, but you are learning to depend on someone else and maybe that's all that person needed in the first place and then they start formulate those feelings for you. It's a really weird and kind of creepy syndrome to really think about, but in a way it's, you're still protecting yourself. You're just not doing it with the means that you would think you would be doing. You're, to me, Stockholm Syndrome is almost outsmarting your captor, except when it becomes real and those bonds and those feelings are genuinely real. A lot of times people say that battered women experience Stockholm Syndrome. That's why they, it's so hard for them to leave their abusers because they have this emotional attachment to them, this dependency. Now, I'm not a psychologist. I never really studied Stockholm Syndrome. I've only read about it I briefly look, went over it when I was in, you know, my gen ed psych classes. But it it's always kind of interest me, interested me in an idea. And when I see films use it, I'm, I'm always intrigued by it and how they do it. Because to me, it is kind of a survival technique, but it's, it's a smart one. But eventually, it, it's like repetition. You, you do something enough, it starts to become real. And it's just a really interesting concept. And it touches on it a little bit here um, with the captors and the hostages. You, you, you start seeing the definitive lines of who's who break down. 
and then you start seeing people, which bleeds into the third theme that's huge in this book, and that's the theme of relationships that cross boundaries. I'm not just talking about relationships with people, I'm talking about relationships that cross a language barrier, because everyone in this book speaks different languages. You have English, Russian, Italian, German, uh, Japanese, and there's only one person in this entire room that can speak all of these languages, and so he's communicating for everybody. And for the beginning, you just constantly see him basically running around like a chicken with his head cut off. And then over time, people start to genuinely learn the way other people talk. They, they learn to communicate in other ways. Roxanne Koss learns to communicate with music, with, with notions, and she ends up falling in love with someone who she would have never in a million years been in contact with had she not been stuck in this room. And it's just amazing what Anne Platchett does with these relationships and how she breaks them down and you start developing and meeting the characters throughout it. And there's one part in this book that I definitely want to read to you guys because it's just, it's just, it's just excellent. I mean, it's just absolutely excellent. So let me just break it out for you, okay? We're going to have a little read along now. This is the character of uh, Fedorov. He's a Russian, and he's talking to Roxanne Koss with the translator Jen. Okay. And he's telling a story about his childhood. It was a tragedy to my grandmother that none of us showed a talent for painting. Even at the end of her life, when I was in school studying business, she was telling me to try again, but it wasn't something I was capable of learning. She liked to say my brother Dmitri would be would have been a great painter but that was only because Dimitri was dead the dead we can imagine to be anything at all my brothers and I were all excellent observers some people are born to make great art others are born to appreciate it don't you think it's kind of a talent in of itself to be an audience whether you're the spectator in the gallery or you're listening to the voice of the world's greatest soprano not everyone can be the artist there have to be those who witness the art who love and appreciate what they have been privileged to see. I thought that was so amazing. I literally stopped after I read that and just sat there for about 20 minutes just thinking about that because I never thought about the talent of the audience. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought about being a reader. We're the audience of these authors, of their art. So I would love to be a writer, I, I would, but I'm much better at watching and listening than I am writing. I would love to write great prose and change the world with my artistic talent, but sometimes being the spectator is your talent. Being the person who is moved by the operas, by the opera singer, being the person who watches relationships form, who reads the words on the page. It takes talent for us to be this dedicated, for us to, to love this. Not everybody's a huge reader, so maybe being a reader is one of our talents. And I never thought about that until I read this book, and I just was so floored. I was like, what? Wow. I wish I read this book back in college because I would have floored so many people in my philosophy class with that. It's not even funny. I love that. I love that passage. It's one of my favorites in this book. The next passage that I really, really enjoyed and I want to read it to you guys because it's excellent. People love each other for all sorts of different reasons, Roxanne said in her lack of her lack of Spanish keeping her innocent from the conversation, slow roasting guinea pigs on a spit. Mm. Most of the time, we're loved for what we can do rather than who we are. It's not such a bad thing being loved for what you can do. And it's not. Most people, and this is one of the other themes, it's not really a large theme. That's why I didn't really include the three, but it's one theme that I just touch on why people are loved, why people are wanted around. Because these relationships that are formed are based off of really what the person can do for you. Not so much who they are, but what they can do. And I really enjoyed that aspect because 
when you think back on your relationships, do people really care about you as a person or what you can do for them or what status you can give them? It's really hard to know the difference. And to blatantly say it like that, I thought was amazing. I gave this book a four out of five stars. This was an amazing book. The only reason it did not get a five star is because the ending was so abrupt. And when you read the book, you want it to end a different way. You do. But there's really no plausible way for the story to end a different way than what it does. And so when it does happen, you're kind of like, well, I saw that coming, but you don't want it to happen. So that's why I gave it a four star because there was a lot of, this is the only way it can end. I don't know any other way this is gonna go that's even plausible. Now granted, it's fiction, but it is fiction that's loosely based off a real story that happened in 1995. A Japanese ambassador was kidnapped and held hostage along with about 25 to 30 other people for about four months in Peru in 1995. That is the historical basis of this story. This story definitely takes a lot of literary license, but it is based off a true fact. So you already kind of know the ending if you know that story. So I had to give it a four out of five stars, but this book is definitely amazing for lovers of opera, for lovers of kind of a psychology kind of, um, mind if you have a very psychological mind I definitely pick this book up because it might give you something that's a little bit different that you're not used to having and if you're a lover of different kinds of relationships if you like to see different things happen I would definitely pick this book up it was definitely worth the read and I am very very glad it's part of my collection and I'm sorry but that is the best first line of the book I have ever read in my entire life and if I ever do a video on best first lines, it's gonna take a lot to beat this one. So, Ann Patchett's Bel Canto. I'm definitely gonna pick up some more of her, work, her works because I love the way she wrote the story. So please go check it out. That's all I got for you guys today. I'll have another review up very, very soon. Um, I'm still working on Larry McMurtry's review. I promise it'll be up, I promise. So um, two thumbs, way, way up like, link, subscribe, do all that jazz. I hope you guys are having a good time and just keep on reading. So have a good one guys. Bye.